nine months into an 18 month project cycle basically at this stage. And the context, uh, this is a, I don't know how much you can see of it, <laughs> but it's a, if we had a, a larger screen size you'd see it a bit more clearly. It is a very quick overview of what's happening with construction in relation to energy. The green bars are yearly figures for house completions in Ireland. So you can see a starting point probably at the end of the previous recession and now the projected figures for 2012 of 500 house completions in contrast with I think the figure is 93,419 in 2006 at peak output. The red line is something that I just superimposed over it and it's a representation of the changes in building regulations and building standards in relation to conservation of fuel and energy. So you might know if I come around. At this point here, we had a building energy rating of approximately C, C1 in, in that area at the uh, level of peak output. So I would suggest this was a, a major missed opportunity in Ireland. I say that because the research that's coming out now, or the data that's coming out now, is indicating that anywhere, it depends on where you get your information, anywhere between maybe 35 and 48% of non-compliance with standards has been uh, found on site, basically, uh, in the house, uh, house construction. And really, that is one of the indicators of the skills gap that is faced on site for blue collar workers, for our operatives, for craftspeople, for system installers, for supervisors. So it's an unprecedented downturn. Don't think anyone's arguing that. And there has been very significant changes in the billing regulations. And this is a pretty key point. The training of construction workers has remained largely unchanged. I'm talking here about the broad training provision the national craft curricula that we have for construction crafts has not reflected this change from here to here. The standards based apprenticeship system was brought in in 1993. There has been limited revisions really to the curricula since then and with the exception of plumbing which had a new curricula brought in in 2006 which did have some content relating to renewable heating systems and heating control systems. The rest of the trades have been virtually untouched when it comes to energy. So the question is, are we ready for near zero energy billings? So the first thing we need to know is, what are near zero energy billings? And I think James has given a separate talk on that in the other room. But basically, that's the standards that we're heading towards. We had our last revision to the billing regulations in 2011. There will be one or two further revisions um, originally planned for 2013. I think now it may be closer to 2016 that will be bringing us to this near, near zero energy framework. So the Build Up Skills initiative is timely. It's an EU initiative, but it's unusual as an EU initiative and project in that it wants to support national consortiums, not EU partnerships as such, to develop a roadmap of qualifications for building workers in each member state. Initially, it started off in November of last year with 21 consortiums, and there were a further nine added in January stroke February of this year. The focus is on skills for energy efficient building and renewable energy deployment towards the achievement of 2020 energy savings targets and it's targeted at craftspeople, on-site construction workers, and system installers. Or basically speaking, everybody on-site involved in the building process. And the emphasis is on the continuing education and training of the workforce, which is particularly important for Ireland in that we are training at this moment so few uh, new apprentices and new entrants into the sector. So what we have is what we have, basically. And that's where we need to concentrate and need to focus on that area. So the Build Up Skills Ireland Consortium is made up of five partners, three from education, 
LIT are the project coordinators through Seamus Hoyne. Ourselves at ITB, uh, Dublin Institute of Technology DIT, we also have representation from the CIF and IC2 in order to round out the consortium have representation from the employer side and from the employee side and the industry side. We have a steering committee which we appointed very early in the project which really has involves the key government departments around energy. Department of Environment in relation to building standards, Department of Energy in relation to policy, the SEAI obviously, FOSS because of the fact that they're the National Training Authority and are particularly involved in vocational and apprenticeship education. And we also have the Irish Green Building Council. What we're aiming towards is, and this is the phase that we're moving into now in the project, is consultation with all relevant stakeholders, all relevant market actors. That's everybody with an interest in this area so that we can come ultimately to an agreement in, on the way forward and we can have a framework that we can endorse and that will actually be meaningful. A new roadmap of qualifications that will be recognized across the industry. Now the timeline. So you'll see first the analysis of the status quo report which was completed towards the end of June stroke July. We're now in the consultation phase and after Christmas we will be looking at the actual roadmap development and the endorsement. This being the key point obviously in the project, getting that endorsement. So the status quo report highlights the key issues around skills and training in this sector. The consultation is to reach agreement on the solutions and the way forward and then ultimately that we'll end up with a nationally endorsed framework. Pace, I'm just trying to get through the slides, is that okay for everyone? I'm just conscious of the time. If most of the slides from now on have uh, quotations from the report basically. So the context here is energy use in buildings accounts for 40% of energy consumption in Ireland. The residential sector accounting for 65, over 65% of this total. The highest proportion is attributed to space, heating, water heating and lighting. All areas of energy use which can be significantly reduced through energy efficient construction and renovation methods. And I believe that this is very important and it's a very important conclusion. Up to now, building, low energy buildings, is being perceived as a kind of a niche subsector within construction. That is no longer the case. The 2011 uh, regulations, which I believe have been enforced since January of this year, are similar, that's a quote from Building Control, similar to passive house standards, on, uh, uh, depending on which element of the construction process, but there are some similarities beginning to appear. And I've asked this question in a, num a number of uh, consultation meetings that we've had. I would take it that most people in the room, if they were going to invest in a low energy building project or a passive house build, that they would not be considering just employing a bog standard construction company, that they will be looking with somebody that would have demonstrated their skills and competences in the area. But the reality now is that we're asking the industry broadly to implement these standards, yet we have not addressed the issue with skills and knowledge in this area. So we've had significant amendments in the building regulations as I've already mentioned. I just wanted to make this point we have a system of building control which is largely defined as self-regulating. Well, it is impossible to self-regulate if you do not know how to do the job properly in the first place. And that's really the key issue that we have on site, I believe, at the moment. Or that's one of our key findings. Current activity, residential sector, 68% of total building construction in 2011. 80 that might seem large in context with the 5,000 house completions that I mentioned. 80% of this activity is estimated to be in the repair, maintenance and improvement sector of the residential construction, which is, obviously has huge implications from the point of view of energy retrofit. This just means that's the activity. 
it doesn't mean that all of this activity in repair, maintenance, and improvement involves significant energy retrofit, but uh, the conclusion will be that it should at this stage, bearing in mind the energy saving targets that we have for 2020. The potential for savings in the non-domestic building sector has been illustrated by successes arising from the public sector program and the Better Energy Workplaces, a scheme that has been oversubscribed in contrast to the Better Energy Homes equivalent. Uh, St. John O'Connor, who you would have seen speaking earlier, he takes exception to me using the word contrast. I'm just trying to make the point really, which is that there's a lack of take up on the schemes in the domestic sector, approximately 50% take up on the grant schemes for SEAI. When we talk about education and training, and I know Joseph is gonna be talking about it from the professional side, uh, we also have to bear in mind that there's education required for consumers, but also they are gonna require support to engage with these energy improvements. So we will not solely achieve 2020 targets through the volume of building retrof buildings retrofitted. And obviously it is in the construction sector, there's going to be true retrofits that we have the potential to reach these targets because it certainly doesn't look like it will be true new construction. It will be the level or combination of measures applied. At the moment we have a system which is an incremental support. It supports incremental measures of improvements. And while the figures may sometimes look reasonable, that we are uh, touching close to the numbers of buildings that were outlined in the National Energy Retrofit Program, the reality is that a lot of these retrofits are the lower hanging fruit, really, the, the soft retrofits, if you want to use that term, and we need to be moving towards a deeper retrofit approach. And deeper measures are going to result in an increased complexity of retrofit. And retrofit is already complex. Sustainable construction, you can teach sustainable construction methods to construction workers. And building a building from scratch, from the ground up, you can apply these principles within reason, with relative ease. Retrofits are very, very challenging. You have multiple different, different, different building typologies. Even within housing schemes, you'll have differences between the buildings and and you'll have differences between the budgets that will be available for retrofits. And in, in itself, it's a very complex area. When we go to deep retrofit, it's more complex again. So far, the funding of upskilling of construction workers has been limited to labor market activation schemes such as Springboard and FOSS courses that are run free to the unemployed. But there has been no government initiative to acknowledge the fact that we have an entire industry requiring some level of training. An industry that's already pretty much on its knees and the prospect of having to fund training and upskilling and allow workers to attend that training I think will be pretty scary for them at the moment. So obviously it's a major barrier. Existing, we have had a lot of genuine efforts made since, say, 2006 tr uh, stroke 2007 to develop training in response to this pretty obvious, or what seems to be pr pretty obvious need. And uh, a lot of them were very, very, uh, very much should be acknowledged. There's a lot of merit to this training. So there's been training programs around renewable energy, which was formalized, so we have a uh, Renewable energy installers through SEAI are required to have completed training on each of the uh, renewable heat technologies uh, before they can be included on an approved list of installers on the grant schemes. We also have had some more programs that have arisen and have been uh, delivered through FOSS and through the Institutes of Technology. And also significantly, and Jason will speak about this in more detail, some manufacturers and suppliers have started to develop and provide significant training as well. So renewable heating, as I mentioned, renewable electricity around PV and small scale wind. Uh, although I would point out that the demand for that training has been related to the demand for 
and the support for those technologies. So therefore, there's been a small amount of training, a small amount of demand. Thermal insulation and air tightness for construction workers. Passive house training has been introduced as well. Uh, some serious passive house training, uh, uh, partnership between the Passive House Academy and FOSS. There's a training facility in the FOSS Training Centre in Finglas, which I would suggest is probably one of the best in Europe. And as I mentioned already, significantly a number of leading manufacturers and suppliers have felt the need to develop product and system specific training. And this may be indicative, and Jason will confirm or deny this, of a perception in the industry that there is a skills gap. So we have manufacturers and suppliers and they're concerned that their products are actually being installed and fitted on site correctly. So not getting too technical on you, but uh, the gap analysis we did, we reviewed the existing training provision, which was the apprenticeship curricula for the construction trades. Also, we reviewed how the non-formal skills at operative level, uh, examples being concrete workers, roofers, glazers, steel workers, how those skills are uh, achieved on site, obviously mostly through experiential learning. We then reviewed this new training provision that's come in, both formal training on, on the National Framework of Qualifications and some of this add-on training that's been provided by uh, manufacturers and suppliers, which is non-accredited. And we then reviewed the skills that we feel are required to achieve these energy saving targets in 2020. So we reviewed the technologies and the installations and what we're currently supporting and what's likely to be uh, the reality on site up to 2020, basically. And we mapped that against what is in the market at the moment and the numbers being trained particularly in this area here. And our findings are, this is a quote from a, the Center for European Vocational Development, a report on green jobs from 2010. And the conclusion that they had was that the skills required are primarily traditional technical skills with additional components and upskilling to address specific skills required for new and emerging technologies. There was nothing in our research that contradicted that finding. That's basically what we have found also to be the case in Ireland. And more specifically, we found that the, skip, the main gap that exists is not a skills gap. And by that I mean construction crafts people have the core technical skills required to install energy efficient construction methods and technology. What they lack is knowledge of energy generally, of energy use, of energy saving potential, and in the area of building services, the training that's been available thus far that's been developed has been largely system specific or product specific, and they're lacking the knowledge of integrating all these technologies and processes into the whole system, in, into the building, which now needs to be considered as a system basically. And probably even a bigger challenge is the need for a change in attitude. Because we have a workforce that is already trained. We have people that have 10, 20, 30, 40 years of experience. And now we're throwing specifications and details at them and telling them this is now the right way to do it. What you thought was the right way is wrong. And basically speaking, in my experience in construction, there's already a question mark about what architects and engineers know <laughs> and don't know. So basically you have to have a buy-in from the workers themselves. They have to understand in principle why they, need, why they need to do the job this way. And also in my experience in construction, the attitude that I have encountered in my years is that near enough is good enough. Basically that's the not, it's not, that's a general statement. There are obviously very good contractors, but generally speaking, near enough is good enough. Well, with low energy construction, near enough is not good enough. Low energy buildings are about adherence to specification and details and an integration between the workers on site 
towards that common goal of achieving these very, very onerous levels of energy performance. So the gap itself, on one side we have what's currently available, on-site learning, apprenticeship, some higher education programs that have been developed over the years. On the other side we have the new training programs that have emerged over the last five or six years. And the gap itself is somewhere in the middle. So what's happened is we've moved from here to here without addressing these issues for the workers. Which as I've mentioned already, why they need to work this way now, what does it, how it affects them on site, the knowledge that they require about these systems and about how they need to interact and integrate with the other crafts and installers on site and how to actually do this. And what we're proposing is that to bridge this gap, we need to address all levels, all occupational tiers on site. From operative level, to craft level to supervisory level, as I mentioned already, everyone involved in the construction process. And we believe that at operative level, we need short training programs on these underpinning principles. Not just training programs, but programs which increase awareness and at least attempt to bring about this change in attitude that's required. And similarly for craft workers as initial training. So I'd refer to these two stages as foundation training that's required by all workers on site. After that, we could then move to more specialist or craft specific training depending on the role of the worker. In other words, for a carpenter who is a second fixed carpenter, he may not require much more than the foundation training. But if we have a carpenter who is working solely in the timber frame construction industry, which is moving towards very, very high levels of low energy and uh, low, or, uh, very, very high levels of performance, energy performance, they may require specific training to fulfill those roles. And very importantly, at supervisory level, we require as supervisors are responsible for the learning that occurs, they're largely responsible for the learning that occurs on site, which is just as important as any training program that we could ever provide. The current system of apprenticeship training is alternating on the job, off the job, on the job, off the job. You learn the principles, you learn the theories, you learn some practice, and then you apply it in real situations on site. So once learners have completed this initial foundation training, and they have understood and accepted and accepted the need for change, then there can be a greater focus on the acquisition of these specialist skills or product or system specific training that they may require. And as I mentioned, as regards numbers, I'm trying to keep the presentation as short as possible. As regards numbers, everyone involved in the construction process requires some level of training at least requires this entry level training. That's our conclusion. And one of the barriers we have is that the trainers employed in this sector have been employed in most cases in the last 10 to 20 years. They've been employed on the basis of their technical uh, skills and knowledge and their experience of implementation on site. The problem is if they were employed 10 between 10 and 20 years ago, they have no experience of the on-site implementation. And there is no formal structure of continuing professional development for these trainers. So even if these principles were introduced into the curricula, we would have to address the skills and knowledge of the trainers also. So the, this move towards low energy buildings has created this gap and the efforts the efforts thus far have not been efficiently coordinated nationally to come up with a solution. And Build Up Skills offers the opportunity to facilitate this nationally coordinated effort. It needs to happen, it needs to happen at a national level and there needs to be a set or a suite of qualifications and trainings that are recognized across the industry. That's the end of the presentation.